Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And uh, welcome to Peter's this morning. It's lovely to have you with us. Today is uh, Trinity Sunday, and uh, we are continuing thinking about our series Church Rebooted, and we're going to be coming to a little a section in Hebrews chapter 10 a little bit later on in our service this morning. Isn't it lovely that summer's arrived yes. at last? Isn't it lovely? So um, heating, church heating switched off and other doors open and it's um, really lovely to have the you know, bright sun sunlight coming in and be warm in here, isn't it, for once? So that's really, really good. Uh, there are, or well, have been, uh, five Sundays in May. We slightly changed the order of our services because it was Pentecost last weekend and we had the band come and play for us, it just seemed right for Pentecost. So today we're doing what we would normally do on a fourth Sunday uh, in our churches, um, so which is we're having a, going to have a more traditional communion service today. So you'll need the green booklet. So I hope you've got one of these uh, near you. If you haven't, there are plenty at the back. Do uh, grab one, uh, and we'll come to that in just a moment. Let's uh, begin with a prayer, and then we're going to uh, listen to a, a lovely hymn that we've been getting to know over these last few months uh, here at St Peter's. It's maybe, I'm not promising, maybe the last time that we do video worship. Um, we'll see how things go next month, of course. But let's pray. Today is Trinity Sunday. So a little bit more than any other Sunday, we think about you, Lord, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons in one. Gracious, loving, Heavenly Father. We worship you today as we come before you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus, who is King of our world. And we gather together in the power of the Spirit who is amongst us today. So Lord God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we worship you afresh this Trinity Sunday. It's good to be together and we pray that you would be exalted in our hearts and minds in this service and in the week ahead. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's uh, listen to and see what we hear play for some screen. Yeah. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. We say together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so as we ask God to cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, we are asking him, well, to do lots of things, but particularly perhaps to help us to see that we make two mistakes, often make two mistakes. We minimise our sinfulness, but we also minimise God's grace and his love. Let's just dwell on that for a moment. We minimise the way in which we've fallen short. We have far too high an opinion of ourselves, usually. But we also minimise God's grace and love. We have far too small a view of his goodness and mercy and his longing that we might be restored to him. That's why he sent his son. And so we pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. We are more wicked than we ever realised, but we are more loved than we ever dreamed. And so, Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And here is a prayer for Trinity Sunday. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us your servants grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship that unity. So keep us steadfast in this faith that we may evermore be defended from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, we're going to hear a Bible reading now, and uh, Jackie is going to come and bring us our first reading today. Wonderful morning. The reading is from Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. In the small of the Bible, I think it's page 853, and in the larger print, 1873. Our call to persevere seems suitable for me. <laughs> Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on to more love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord.
Jackie, thank you for reading us a minute ago, and do have that passage open, um, page 1873 in the Big Black Bibles, and I can't remember the number of the small ones, but I'm sure someone will help you out. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 25, we heard. And they began with these words, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open through us, through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near. Now I'm just about old enough to remember when a lettuce was just a lettuce. <laughs> Not an iceberg, or a butterhead, or a romaine, or a Chinese, or a loose leaf. Uh, can, I have, can I have a lettuce, please? Uh, yeah, would serve like a Boston, or a crisp head, or a cos. Of course, that's not a conversation that happens very often these days. That is unless you buy your lettuces at the farmer's market every week, and you ask the person behind the stall. Of course, usually when you buy a lettuce these days, you just put the lettuce of your choice in your basket, either your online basket or your real basket, or probably trolley at Tesco. Now there are hundreds of varieties of lettuce, aren't there? Well, in case you think I've momentarily gone mad, um, lettuces do have a bit or something to do with Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 to 25. There are five lettuces. Let us draw near to God. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Let us consider how we may spur one another on. Let us not give up meeting together. Let us encourage one another. Each one a little gem worth meditating on. <laughs> come on, come on, you need a rocket. You need a rocket for under you. Gosh, you're, a bit, you're a bit ahead of Sam Pacorni, though. It was a little titter, wasn't it? Actually, I think when uh, Julie was there, you got it, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah well done. She was awake. She was awake because she knows that she was coming to two services this morning. She was doing the prayers at this one and she sang at the last one. So. Anyway, well here in this great passage today of Hebrews, actually really we've arrived at the kind of theological high point of the letter, uh, actually, we kind of jumped in, which you shouldn't really do, you should, you know, take time to ascend the mountain if you read the whole letter, uh, but nevertheless, you know, there's still wonderful treasures in here that we can just leap in and, and draw out, and you can read the rest of the letter, of course, at your, at your leisure. But uh, today we're longing and we're thinking about how we might be a church full of encouragement, that's the next in our series of church rebooted a church full of encouragement and and this is kind of the high point of the encouragingness that's a word of uh, the letter to the hebrews we long do we not to be a people here a place in peter's where we can come weary and weighed down as we often are when we come to church and be built up one again whether that's on a sunday or whether that's, whether that's through one of our other ministries we can come and be built up we Christians, we talk about encouragement a lot, don't we? We use that word, or so-and-so was, or something was really encouraging. But it's an idea that we're, we're used to, 
Maybe we're not actually very good at it though. Sometimes I think we're probably more used to the idea that we are good at it, you see what I mean? I think we can easily forget that in our sin-wrapped world, it, it is so, em so often empty of this kind of encouragement. Even actually church can be like that as well, even though we may use the word a lot. Some people, some of us, never hear words like, well done, keep going, you're doing really well. You don't hear that enough. H how can I help you? You know, you, you are such a great friend. You know, you are a fantastic son, mother, auntie, colleague, father, wife, husband. You are great at dot, dot, dot. You know, we don't hear that enough, do we? In a, we live in an age which is very easily given to sentimentality. It really is. But yet, still so many people feel bereft of true encouragement. Because one doesn't lead to the other necessarily, does it? Encouragement is not just mere sentiment. The word means to give heart to. Courage, core, heart. Give heart to. And I, I was trying to think of examples, and there are many, but the one that seemed to spring to mind for some reason, I don't know why, what does it say about me? Uh, you remember those times, sadly it is times, when England had been knocked out of a World Cup or a big football competition with a penalty shootout? We actually survived the penalty shootout in the last World Cup, didn't we? Got to the semi-final. But do you remember that, well, the most famous one is probably Euro 96, isn't it? We got knocked out in the semi-final on a penalty shootout to Germany. And there at the end of the match, do you remember it? Terry Venables, the England manager, putting his arms round, consoling and encouraging a weeping Gareth Southgate. Now, people don't remember that he actually defended brilliantly that tournament, much like Chelsea defended brilliantly last night in the Champions League final. Of course, sadly, what they remember of Gareth Southgate in Euro 96 is the penalty miss. But Southgate himself has said that the way the manager and the rest of the team got around him in the days after that loss went a long way to making him the England manager that he is now. And uh, the Euros are just around the corner, aren't they, next month. Encouragement. It's life-changing sometimes. And so many families, sadly, so many marriages, so many organisations and even churches are starved of true encouragement. We're very good at being nice to each other. But are we good at actually really encouraging each other, giving heart to one another? Perhaps as I say this, you are thinking about painful memories or even painful presence uh, uh, of being bereft of encouragement. Maybe your childhood had a painful lack of encouragement in it. Perhaps you're thinking of somebody now who actually you know that you owe a bit of encouraging towards. In fact, actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about it. 10 second pause. Think of someone right now who you could encourage. And I'm going to give you till the end of tomorrow to do it. I'm sure there's somebody you can think of, even if we have felt that we have lacked encouragement at times in our lives, maybe we could be the answer to someone else's prayers and encourage them. You got till the end of tomorrow to action that one. But let's have a look at these five lettuces for our Sunday lunch then. Five lettuces, I think you've got a bit more than lettuce for your Sunday lunch, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll do these five lettuces. And the writer of the Hebrews here, he's been building an argument throughout this letter uh, he's been trying to help wobbly Jewish converts to Christ, to keep going with Christ. That's the issue. Keep going, keep going, he's saying, all the way through the letters, the letter in different words. Uh, they are ethnic Hebrews, ethnic Jews in the first century church who have come to faith in Christ. Is a word they kind of crossed over to faith in Christ. They realised that Jesus is the promised Messiah for the Jews and for the world. He is indeed prophet, priest and king. The, 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 the prophet, priest and king that the scriptures had foretold. And through the letters of the Hebrews, the writer builds that argument and reminds them of, of 
what they have come to know, that they won't slink back, that they won't go back. And it's largely due to persecution that they are, they are being tempted to jack in this Christian thing and just to blend back in with the dominant Jewish culture from which they've come. Pay more careful attention to what you have heard, he begins the letter, beginning in chapter 2, so that you don't drift away. And the idea is one of drifting back, drifting back to the shoreline, as it were, of, of their Jewish faith. Now sadly, so many people in church drift in and then drift out again. And it would seem that lack of encouragement and lack of team spirit in the fellowship was the, was the major contributing factor to, to the drifting out, the drifting back that was going on in the early church amongst the Hebrew Christians. And that feels familiar, doesn't it? We, we may, know, may not be Hebrew converts from that background, but that drifting in and then, then that drifting back out again to the, to the dominant culture of our day is a familiar part, isn't it? In chapter 10, the big idea that the writer's been building uh, up until uh, this chapter and then through the chapter to where we read is that Christ's great sacrifice on the cross is far greater than the old way. It's far greater than going back to the sacrificing of bulls and goats in the temple under the old covenant. That's what he's been saying. People can now be cleansed from sin once and for all because of Jesus. You don't have to go back again a week later and sacrifice something else in order to get cleansed or stay cleansed. No, Jesus has cleansed once for all. Jesus' work on the cross is full and final and utterly sufficient to cover our sins. Therefore, we can approach God. Therefore, you can approach God by the blood of Jesus, he writes to them. What a joy that is. It's all been done by Christ and it counts for us. So let us draw near, he says. The first letter is, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. Those are ceremonial words from the Old Covenant. And the ceremony has been completed now because Christ has performed the great ceremony and the sprinkling of his blood, like the sprinkling that went on with the priest in the temple, is now cleansing our hearts by the blood of Christ. That is the first lettuce. Let us draw near. The draw near lettuce. Draw near to God because sin no longer, longer stops us. It's done with. It's paid for. Now we might drift away from faith in Christ because we've never fully grasped the meaning of that and the full significance of it that through him, through Christ, we can, you can, come near to God spiritually now and physically one day in glory. What a wonderful thing that is. He is the access. Jesus is the way. He is the ticket. He is the way that God has graciously provided for you and for me to know him. That there isn't any other way. It's not worth trying another way because there isn't one. God is found through Christ and their life, hope and meaning is found in his name. So money and family and work and leisure and all these things that we enjoy, a beautiful Sunday, they're all great blessings, aren't they? But none are God. None are God. And they will all be found one, wanting one day, won't they? Even family, money, some of the things that are the most precious to us, time with friends, they will all be found wanting one day on a day when only Jesus will be the one who doesn't let us down. So draw near, because your sins have been paid for. God has come all the way to meet us in our sin and draw us to himself in the person of Christ. Wonderful. That's the first letter. Second letter, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. Hold fast to hope. That's what this lettuce is all about. Hold fast to hope. Now, hope is a word that kind of has fresh poignancy at this time, doesn't it? After all that's been going on in this last year. Vaccine hope has been very high on the agenda in the last few months. And undoubtedly, vaccine hope is proving faithful. It really is. 
I mean, as much as countries around the world have advanced vaccine rollouts, is as much as they are getting on top of the virus. And that's, we've seen that in our country. Of course, we have. The vaccines have their detractors, they do. And everyone has got a story about a sore arm, haven't they? Or feeling a bit dodgy for a couple of days having had a, a vaccine. And some people have got worse stories than that, sadly, about them. But to one degree or another, and it looks like a, to a pretty great degree, the vaccines have brought hope. They, they have. Along with all the other vaccines that you and I have received in our lives. You know, the ones that we wouldn't think to question. Because, well, it's not cool to question those, is it? I mean, I wrote in roundabouts about this in, in January. As a child of the 1970s, I've received a number of vaccines, and you probably would have received most, if not all, of these. Polio, tetanus, measles, rubella, whooping cough, TB, that's the BCG one. And there's also vaccines that I haven't received because I haven't needed to, because they've been eradicated by vaccines ages ago, like smallpox, which was the first vaccine that was developed. All these things bring hope, they do. But not, not hope anything like to the degree that Christ brings hope. Not true hope in that sense. Vaccines and medicine bring healing. They do. Wonderful. And sometimes healing comes in unexplainable ways. Ways that are only explainable by the fact that they're a miracle from God. Praise the Lord for that too. But all of the above there is only temporary, isn't it? I mean, we, we've heard the phrase used quite a lot. Uh, you know, vaccines save lives, or medicine saves lives. Actually, they don't save lives. They just delay death a bit, don't they? Think about that for a minute. Medicine doesn't actually save lives. And I say this as someone who's got many medics in my family, all of whom are, are wonderful. But actually, they, they would agree, medicine doesn't save lives, it just delays death, doesn't it? Pushing the inevitable into the slightly longer grass for all of us. Now I realise that's a bit of a sobering and sombre message on a beautiful Sunday that perhaps we don't want to hear, but it is true, isn't it? It is true. Full hope, true hope, is in the gospel that we profess, isn't it? Eternal healing, eternal life is in Christ who is faithful. So let us hold fast to that hope. As much as we might hold fast to other kinds of hope, vaccine hope, medicine hope, etc., etc., we need to hold more fast, faster to that hope, the hope that is our profession in the gospel. I'm going to take the last three lettuces together as one big lettuce mashup rocket, cos, and butter head mashed together. Would you put them together? I don't know, because it's all just lettuce as far as I'm concerned. It's all leaf, an extra next to my burger. Uh, I'm going to say these ones together. Uh, and the theme, the theme we're thinking about today particularly is, is encouragement. And that is a currency of immense value in the life of the church, one of encouragement. Encouragement is of immense value in, uh, in our world in general, but particularly here in church. Let us consider how we may spare one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, and the third lettuce in our mashup. Let us encourage one another as you see the day approaching. And you can see how it easily happens, or how it did easily happen. You know, being a Christian and staying a Christian just gets a little bit harder each day, doesn't it? It doesn't get easier each day, it gets harder each day, staying a Christian. And for the Hebrews, that was very much the case back in the first century. The main reason it got harder for them was because of persecution. Persecution from their ethnic brothers and sisters who had seen them change. You see them go from being Jewish brothers and sisters to now Christian, I don't quite know what. That change must have been huge. You know, they would have seen their family members you know, throwing off their Jewish heritage you know, and not going to temple any longer and meeting with other detractors on the day after the Sabbath, you know, they, they, why are they meeting on a Sunday? Well, they meet on a Sunday because their Lord apparently rose again on a Sunday. Well, okay, all right. I mean, you can see how that would have been hard for their, their, their fellow brothers and sisters as Jews to, to take. You know, they, they don't go to synagogue as often. And when they go to synagogue, they now do something rather different when they get there. 
They've got new feasts that they're celebrating, so they're not going to celebrate our feasts any longer. They've got new customs that, that they're getting used to and that seem very alien to, to us as ethnic Jews and to looking at this lot who've now crossed over. They're wearing different clothes. They're eating all foods. They're even, even eating foods that we're not allowed to eat. They're eating the non-kosher foods as well. Did you see that? They're now eating the non-kosher foods. And they're making a really big deal of, of bread and wine all of a sudden. Now, well, we love bread and wine too, but, but why are they making such a big deal about a feast of bread and wine weekly on, a, on, on, on the day after the Sabbath, on a Sunday? What's that all about? You can see how it, how it runs. And so they're persecuted, aren't they? And they're encouraged back. And it would have been harder to have stayed a Christian in that context, wouldn't it? They meet to praise that strange prophet, Jesus. Wasn't he the one that died? Well, they don't think so. You can see how it works. They're passing around letters. They're passing around letters. You remember that guy, that, that ex-Pharisee, Saul? They, they passed around his letters. You know, he was one of ours. He was the best. Well, he's gone over as well. He's now there great preacher and letter writer. And they're writing so-called new scriptures. They seem to quite like our old scriptures, but they've got their own new ones now. They call them epistles, letters. What a change Christ brought to people back in, in the early church in that day. People who went over to him. Well, it must have been revolutionary. I don't think we can probably quite get our heads around how revolutionary it would have been to have been a Hebrew Christian. So tempting for them to slink back, wouldn't it have been? To go on native again, to go back to where they came from. And that is the case for us today. In a very different kind of culture, in a very different kind of way, it would be very tempting for us to slink back. So many people in the UK, so many people in England, have had a touch of Christianity in their story, one way or another. Back at school, assemblies, or Sunday school, or I don't know, went to the Christian Union at university for a bit, or went to a chapel for a while because, well, we were a chapel family, or whatever it might be. But then life gets in the way, doesn't it? Life gets in the way, things happen, and they slink back, and they don't go as often. Holiness becomes, well, basically a bit of a drag, actually. Rather than the joy of living God's way, living his life to the full, living distinctively as a Christian becomes just a little bit too difficult. Other people might begin to notice that I'm not quite as I should be, and I think they might judge me for it. And so it's just easier just to not go, just to slink back. As to love and good deeds, well, do you know what? I'd rather just keep my head down, because then I can kind of do what I want dabble with what I used to dabble with and maybe no one will notice and you know if I try and spur someone else on to love and good deeds well then that will just reveal my hypocrisy you can see how it happens can't you as for regularly meeting with others I just get inconvenient after a while and of course one of the great currencies of all of our lives is our own convenience we live by that don't we all of us do and so meeting weekly becomes meeting maybe twice monthly. And then it becomes meeting, well, kind of when I feel like it, when it's convenient. And then, well, hardly ever at all. And we wonder why our joy in the Lord leaks away. It leaks away because we're not getting that great source of encouragement and building up the fellowship of others brings us as we gather around his word and gather around the sacraments of bread and wine. And we just slink back, don't we? It's so sad, and we've all seen it. Whether we've had it ourselves, we've had a period of slinking back, maybe we feel like we're in it now, even though we're here today. And I realise I'm preaching this on a bank holiday weekend, which is a bit of an you know, interesting situation to preach into. And we're not hugely numbered today. And not everybody's always going to be here every week. I completely understand that. Three of my family aren't here today. There's other things going on uh, today. I realise we can't always be here. But let's pray that it's not a slinking back from our wonderful Saviour and slinking back from this beautiful community of brothers and sisters who are here to encourage us, who are here so we can encourage them. Now I realise the church is not always brilliant. Of course it isn't. We're a bunch of sinners, aren't we? The church is not always brilliant. 
I fully appreciate that. But Jesus is always brilliant. So let's not slink back from him. And we're about him. And so hopefully at least it's brilliant sometimes. He is always brilliant. So don't let it happen. Don't let that slinking back, that backsliding, that, you know, disappearing, going native. Don't let it happen to you. Don't let it happen to your neighbour. Keep encouraging one another. Come to be encouraged. Come to encourage. Draw near to God. Draw near to others. Those two things go hand in hand, don't they? As we draw near to God, so we will draw near to others. As we draw near to other Christians, well, we'll find probably that we're drawing nearer to God. Because that's what happens amongst Christians. They go hand in hand. I pray that after this year of difficulty, yeah, it's been hard to meet together. When we have met together, we can't quite meet in the way that we would like to. Even today, you know, we can't sing in the way that we would like to sing. Hopefully those things are going to change very soon. But I hope that as we kind of emerge from all this business, that we will be reinvigorated, that we will, will be rebooted, that we will treasure assembly all the more. We will treasure our assembly, our ecclesia, our church, our gathering, all the more, because it is a really, really important thing. It is a precious entity in the world today, because here we can draw near to God together, here we can draw near to one another together. So five lettuces then. Enjoy your lettuce today for your lunch. Maybe uh, ponder these lettuces a little bit more on your own. Let us draw near to God. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Let us consider how we may spur one another on. Let us not give up meeting together. Let us encourage one another. Let us pray. Let's pray. And so our prayer, Lord, as we do these things, is that we, as we do them, we would indeed be entering through the narrow way, the way that leads to life, the way of Christ, your Son. Help us by your Spirit. We can't do this on our, on our own, in our own strength. As we help one another, help us, we pray. Reinvigorate our fellowship, reinvigorate our walk with you, individually and corporately. To your praise and glory. Amen. Well, we're going to continue uh, in prayer, and um, Julie is going to come and lead us in prayer. She's going to tell us a little bit about something we're going to pray about as well before then. So, over to Julie. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm going to, uh, well, Nick's asked me to give you a little bit of an update with Street Pastors. Um, it has, as with many things, it's been a very strange year for Street Pastors. We normally go out on a Saturday night and sort out the nighttime economy. And of course, there hasn't really been much of a nighttime economy. Um, so uh, we haven't actually been out of an evening very, very many times really over the past year. Uh, we did venture out into the light of day, which was quite scary really, because people could actually see us and they weren't drunk either, so they could see us as we really are. Um, but it was really amazing. We went out on Saturday afternoons and we just, uh, or Saturday morning, um, and we just uh, talked to the people that were around and about in the town. We had some really interesting conversations and hopefully we were able to encourage them as well because it, it's been a time when people have been very concerned and very worried. So hopefully um, we helped with that a little bit. Um, we've also um, lost one or two members of the team uh, due to various circumstances. So the team's a little bit smaller than it was. Um, but we have had, notably, one addition to the team, which is Barry Tom, And uh, we welcomed him as a trustee. Um, he's coming on to our board of trustees. Um, and we really look forward to his um, uh, input into the Ministry of Street Pastors. Um, going forward, uh, it may be that things have to be done very differently because uh, I think it will take a while for the nighttime economy to really get back to where it was. Um, and we are doing something a week on Monday, which we've never done before, uh, which is to be around at the time that the Oakhampton College 
finishes for the afternoon and all the students pour out. And we're going to be there and hopefully we're going to be able to chat to some of them and engage with some of them and hopefully encourage them too because I think that the youngsters in particular have found the last year very difficult uh, and uh, so hopefully the, um, you know, that will be really helpful. So we would really value your prayers about that because this is something very, very different uh, to what we usually do and also um, you know, just to what the future will look like for street pastors. It's not just here in Oakhampton, it's really across the whole nation that street pastor teams have had to change the way that they, they do things. And um, one, one of the things we realise is we're not actually called night pastors, we are called street pastors. So we can be out on the streets at any time, uh, whenever we're needed. And um, so what we really would like to know is when are we going to be needed? Who can we help the most? When does God want us to be there? So, um, and I would say, as I always do, if anybody's interested in joining the team, either as a trustee or a street pastor or as a prayer pastor, do come and have a chat to me about it. And of course, one of the things that people have been concerned about is staying um, out really late at night. Um, but of course, that probably won't happen for some while, even when we go back to doing nighttime um, uh, patrols. It may well be that we finish earlier than we used to anyway, because um, the uh, late night licences are probably not going to come back um, into being for a little while yet. So please have a think and a pray about that. It's a really worthwhile uh, ministry and you certainly, it's a bit of an eye opener as well. So um, we always find it very interesting and uh, yeah, so if you, if you are interested, just, uh, just let me know. Now I have another apology because um, I realise we have another lettuce. Because I start, I'm going to start this with Let's Pray. So I do apologise for that. Um, now I don't know whether you think that um, Nick needs prayer for his sense of humour or whether we need to encourage him, but I'll leave you to do that. So, let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can gather together as your people to praise and worship you, serve you and encourage one another here today. Thank you that church is your idea, that Jesus says he will build his church, and that we're the living stones he builds with. We are, incredibly, amazingly, the bride of Christ, who Jesus gave himself for, to, present, to be presented as radiant, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless, which quite honestly blows our mind. In today's reading, as we encourage not to give up meeting together, which is something that's been presented as a challenge to us over the last year, where there's been times we've not been allowed to meet because of rules imposed during the pandemic, or because we've had to self-isolate or shield. Like so many things we've previously taken for granted, we found that when we denied them, they become more precious to us. And the times when we've been prevented from gathering with our church family has made us appreciate church all the more. Recognising the importance of church, and as we reboot, starting this new season in our spiritual journey, we ask for your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, prompting us to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts he longs to impart to us, empowering us to serve you and our community, to use and develop the gifts you have given us for the benefit of all, helping us to be the church you want us to be. We thank you for answered prayer, particularly for Christine Bruce, and we pray that you will continue your healing in her life. We lift up others in our fellowship who are unwell at this time, especially Chris Hall, and we pray for your healing and also your peace to reign in the hearts of Chris and Sheila and the family as they continue to put their trust in you. There may be others who you would like to pray for, and so please use the next few moments to lift them up to the Lord. <coughs> street pastors and ask that you will use the team to reach out to the community in these challenging times, guiding us as to whether, when and where we should be ministering and arranging divine appointments. 
We ask for more people to be called to serve on the team, whether as street pastors, prayer pastors or trustees. We think especially of the opportunity to meet with more young people, many of whom have had a particularly difficult year due to the disruption and uncertainty caused by the pandemic. We think of those who live in areas of conflict and in particular lift up the situation in Israel to you. We pray the ceasefire will hold and that a way can be found for people to live in peace and harmony with one another, with mutual respect and consideration, and for an end to violence and hatred. We thank you for the successful vaccination programme in this country and pray for those who live in countries where the pandemic is still causing untold suffering. In your mercy, please help their overstretched medical services to cope and enable them also to get an effective vaccination programme underway. And help us all in the coming week to be an encouragement to one another, to show love and kindness and be a blessing to all those we come into contact with. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So we continue our service towards the top of page three in the green booklets. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. So lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and loved your creation. You gave your son Jesus Christ to be our saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you, saints and angels, praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit on us, that broken bread and wine out poured may be signs for us in the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine again, he praised you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him, we plead with confidence his sacrifice, made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him our great high priest, our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit. Inspire us with your love. And unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. And as Jesus teaches, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in so draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, 
trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may have a more dwell in him, and he in us. So come to this table not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come not because you are worthy to approach him, but because he died for sinners. Come because he loves you and gave his life for you. Shit. 